It is my very great pleasure to introduce the recipient of the Siebert Award for 2004, my old friend and colleague, Abu Gonzalez. Uh, the Siebert Award, which is the highest award Erpa can bestow, is in honor of a pioneer in radiation protection, Rolf Siebert, and is awarded to someone who has made outstanding contributions to radiation protection. Arbol's early career, of course, was in Argentina, uh, but he soon burst onto the international arena uh, and developed the worldwide reputation he has today. Um, in this, he was following the meteoric rise of Dan Benenson, of course, also from Argentina, who was in many ways a mentor to both of us. I don't need to say very much about Arbel's profile and career. I think that there will be hardly anyone in this room who doesn't know him, and by the end of his lecture, there will be no one who doesn't know him. So, given that we have a bit pressed for time, I will ask him to take the stand and deliver the 2004 Siebert Lecture. Thank you very much, Jeff. Dear colleagues, let me say, to start a few words, in my mother tongue, Syria, the language of Spain. Quisiera compartir con ustedes la emoción que tengo en este momento. La emoción que todos ustedes me han brindado, todos mis colegas, todos mis colegas del IRPA, esta un, única organización, que ha hecho volver a España, a un hijo de un inmigrante español, de un gallego trabajador que llegó a Argentina hace muchos años, y hoy su nieto vuelve aquí a recibir estos honores. Esto me, me emociona enormemente y les agradezco a todos que me hayan dado esta oportunidad de que esto ocurra aquí en mi, en mi madre patria. Quiero ser, seguramente agradecer a mis compañeros internacionales de tantas organizaciones, de la ANSKEA, del ICRP, a mis compañeros de la agencia que tanto me han ayudado a mi carrera profesional. Pero claro, mi corazón ha estado siempre en el lugar donde yo nací profesionalmente, en un pequeño lugar llamado Ezeiza, cerca de Buenos Aires, y a todos mis queridos amigos de Buenos Aires que están acá, les digo, mi corazón siempre está con ustedes. En memoria de Don Benison, en este lugar donde nacimos todos en la profesión. Esta es la maqueta de nuestros laboratorios y acá está Dan, mucho más joven, junto con el doctor Eklund de la agencia, creando ese laboratorio. Gracias a todos por este honor. Y ahora, claro, mis amigos españoles me dijeron que mi castellano es tan malo que prefieren que hable es mi mal inglés y no este, en esta lengua así que voy a escuchar el inglés and my lecture will be on protecting life against the advent effect attributed to radiation exposure but my center will be on towards a global harmonized radiation protection regime but the content will have a part on epistemology what we know and we do not know about the effect of radiation, our paradigm on radiation protection, the controversy that has been with us for many years already in many issues, the challenges that we have to the future, and then some part of navigation to the future. Please be tolerant. The part one is on epistemology, and I will have a motto for this. There is not a single rule, however plausible, and however firmly ground in epistemology that is not violated at some time or another. Our path to knowledge in this area 
have clinical diagnostic, epidemiological estimation, animal experimentation, cellular biology. This is we give our science of knowledge in this area. But there are limits to this science, and we have to recognize that. What we know can be summarized in this graph. If we plot the likelihood of, of harm versus doses, we know for certainty that there will be harm at high doses, this harm that we call deterministic. And we have epidemiological study that shows harm at low doses, but with some limits in gas epidemiology. Below that limit, only biology can help us, and we call this stochastic, just to make our life a little more difficult. The cell has been the concentration of our effort from the beginning, and radiation, studying the effect of radiation on cells. In fact, on the nucleus of the cell, and on the DNA that is there, in particular to the condensation of the DNA in the chromosome. There is where our effort has been located until now. Only that. And in the damage that radiation produces on this DNA. Our, see, the system is very simple. Following radiation hitting the nucleus, either there is no change in that DNA or it is a DNA mutation. That has been the basis of our epidemiology until now. The probability is easy to calculate. It's a formula like this, in which we have ignored all the powers higher than two because of trivia, and we created like this the so-called linear quadratic re relationship with an exponential factor that show the death of cells after high doses. But we know that at low doses the frequency of interaction is extremely low. At one millisiever per year is in the order of one interaction per year per cell. Therefore this expression has been reduced by taking away the quadratic and taking away the exponential, and this is the famous linear dose response at low doses. With this relationship, mutation occurs proportional with the probability proportional to dose, and three possible outcomes are possible. Either the mutation is repaired, and we have a viable cell, either the cell dies due to mutation or due to other causes, and we have an unviable cell, or the cell survive, but mutate, and we have what we call the stochastic effects. The first possible outcome is a viable cell. And this happened because it's very effective the repair system on mutation. Just one of the systems is with enzymes that recognize lesion and release damage base, that make incision and release remaining sugar that fill resulting gap, but need remains, seal the need, and repair is completed, and DNA has been repaired with no loss of genetic information. This is what normally happens. The second possible outcome is the cell death. And this is what we know well. When many cells are dead, we have burns, organ failure, death, with a probability that go quickly to 100% after high doses about millisiever, about thousand of millisiever. And I apologize to the puristic that I am using millisiever for this. The third possible outcome that the cells survive are mutated we give stochastic effects. The stochastic effects that we have been studying are basically three. Cancer, hereditable, and something that people can say whether it's stochastic or not, the antenatal effects. The prevalent opinion on radiation-induced cancer is simple. Once the radiation mutates DNA, it changes the star that may lead to malignant conversion and metastasis of the malignancy, what we normally call cancer. The carcinogenesis occurs because mutations can occur at least in proto-oncogenes, which will lead to cancer, in tumor suppressor genes that are unavailable, unavailable now to stop cancer, in repair genes that are now causing not repair of the, of, the, of the cell, or in genes triggering cell death that now will be unable to kill a cell that has been modified. 
fiber. In very simple terms, if a mutation occurs in a proton protein or tumor suppression gene, can be either repaired or the cell can be killed, but if this do not happen, there is a big chance that this will evolve into cancer. This is the system that we have in front of us. And once that this happened, the theory said, from the cell initiation, we probably will have a dysplasia, a benign tumor with more or less additional mutations, malignancy, and finally a metastasis. We, our epistemiology has been support by epidemiological estimates of the risk of given to radiation exposure. The nuclear bomb survivors, here in this map of Hiroshima, you can see the areas that were completely destroyed, and also the round circle show the areas where people would have died of the deterministic effect. As you can see, people in Hiroshima didn't die from radiation, but from the effect of the blast. But many survived. And that are the basis of our epidemiological estimate. Professor Shigematsu in IRPA 10 gave a brilliant lecture of all this data. And the only thing that I am trying to do is to update you a little with the information. From the 86, 500 individuals of both sexes and age which survived, the 45 year follow up tell us that there are 9,335 solid cases, maybe cancer deaths. But there were expected 8,895. Therefore, we have an extra of 440 cancer, or 5% of all cancers, which can be attributable to radiation. Of course, 440 different uh, is an important number of people, but proportionally, it's not such a big number. Just to see what that means, if these are the expected numbers of cancer deaths, and these are the ones observed, you will see that we have a delta of 440 cancers extra. To see this statistically reasonable well with 95% confidence, we need two sigmas, 588. For we have only 3.7 sigmas for seeing this statistically. This is not so easy. And the excess risk of all solid cancers are clearly shown for different natural exposure, different attained age, there is a clear excess cancer increase. There is an excess relative risk increase. And this happened for basically a very vast number of tumors with an excess relative risk clearly about with an average that is around 0.5 in this moment with 90% confidence interval. Moreover, if you take some of these cancers and you plot it and you try to, to, to put this point, to get something of all these points, other is a very clear linear relationship. This is the case of, of colon cancer, for instance. But of course, we know the difficulty that we have in, in, in lower doses. In summary, the epidemiological estimate that we have for cancer risk it's 0.9% for leukemia, 11% for solid cancer, a little more for women. Per C, per, per, after 1,000 millisiever of acute dose. We know that we have two models of cancer projection. The so-called additive model, in which the background increased to, to normally a constant value, and the so-called multiplicative load model, where the background, uh, above the background, is proportional. Uh, we are using this model in our projection, but just to give an idea for women, this will give a 13% of dimension for you. If we would have used the additive model, it would have been 8%, not a big, big deal. For low doses, we need to reduce from our quadratic expression the estimates, and we reduce by a factor of two approximately in this moment. Therefore, the low cancer risk estimate in this moment with a DDF of two and depending on projection model is between 0.04% and 0.006% per millisiever, that is to say approximately 0.005% per millisiever, that is the value 
that we are using for our standards. For hereditary effects, we have had, after many years of study, the final decision, position of estimates from the United Nations Scientific Committee on Effects of Atomic Radiation, and we have one order of magnitude lower than the risk for cancer. And for antenatal effects, we know that between the 8 and the 15 week pregnancy, we have a serious high probability of moving the IQ of the, of the bone to the left for increasing the mental retardation with 30 IQ units per 1,000 millisieverts, which can be converted to a risk of 0.05% approximately. This is what happened, and this is how the fraction of retarded children are shown after an irradiation in utero during the 8 and the 15 week pregnancy. In conclusion, we can put just a reader digest, digest summary of what we know on this. Risk factors for early clinical effects of doses, for antenatal effects, for cancer, or for hereditary effects. The part two of my presentation will talk on the radiation protection paradigm we have now. And my motto will be, in paradigm choice, there is no standard higher than the ascent of the relevant community. And we should not forget that. Our basis are the estimated risk of radiation health effects and also the level of natural background doses. We now know a little more about this relationship. We know that the risk factors are the ones that I have shown to you there in the low dose range. And we can therefore formulate our paradigm, the basis under which we construct our system. Above background dose and increment dose will result in a proportional increment of stochastic effect with these two risk factors. And we can plot this in a CAR-PCR diagram that will start after a very high point of background incidence and background annual dose. And we can say that above this point, an increment in dose results in an increment of probability with a risk factor that are the numbers that I showed you before. In this area, the relationship is really relevant for radiation protection purposes, and I will use more while to discuss it. We have also a perspective in natural background. We know that there is a minimum of 1, an average of 2.4, up to a very high level of cancer. The majority of people around the world are around, around 2.4. But there are few people in few areas of the world that have at a, around 100 millisieverts per year of exposure. Under this basis, we build our current system of standards. For workers, which is a very special case, because they are voluntary and individual monetary exposure. All occupational exposure is considered. Some of them is amenable to control and must be controlled by the employer. Some of them is an amenable to control, control and be excluded. And on this basis, we have built our system of limitation. For normal doses, with annual, annual dose limit and average dose limit, and with optimization of protection. And also, for rescue workers, an important issue in this moment, with much higher values for voluntary rescue workers. We have special provisions for the female workers because we don't consider the unborn and the infant that she is feeding a part of the workforce. For members of the public, which are involuntary not individual monitor exposures. For good or for bad, we have divided the issue in two. We have addressed planned activities, the, what do we call practices, where we constrain the expected additional doses, and we have addressed existing situations, we call it interventions, where our aim is to reduce the extant avertable dose. The practices, as this graph shows, is when you introduce an activity which will create an expected additional dose and our system tries to control the dose limit with constraint and optimization this expected additional dose. With values that in this moment 
you know very well, are an individual limit of one receiver below their optimization of protection with constraints recommended of 0 0.3, 0 0.1 when the source is of prolonged exposure and with a regulatory exception of 0 0.01. Of course, people are irradiated by many, many sources. And because of that, we need to protect them with the dose limit, covering all the exposure from all sources. And we want to be sure that one of these sources do, do not take the full share of the dose limit. For that reason, we protect them also with the source of claim, which apply only to that source. For interventions, we suppose that we found a situation where we have not forecast before, and there we want to ask two questions. The first, should we reduce the extant dose? How much should we avert that dose? And knowing that the new background will remain. The criteria for intervention that we are using internationally say that when we approach the dose of 100 per year intervention is almost always justifiable. Around the mean intervention may or may not be justifiable, depending on the case. And very low intervention certainly is not likely to be justified, otherwise we have to walk away the wall. In summary, the system has been worked now. Have a basis on background, a basis on the risk factors that we, uh, we have solved, a basis of intervention for a given extant individual dose, and above that background, if a source is added, there are restrictions on the additional dose to that source. Restrictions that in this moment are the ones that have been shown in the, in, the, in the slide. But I will call you the paradigm. In paradigm choice, there is not a standard higher than the ascent of the relevant community. And our profession has always been clear, saying this is a decision-aiding process based on radiation protection consideration. But the decision-making process should involve relevant stakeholders and search for their informed consent. This is what we have built up to today. But a lot of controversy has been around this. And my motto here will be that when a subject ceases to be a subject of controversy, it ceases to be a subject of interest. For that reason, we have to deal with the controversy. First of all, we know there is a controversy of LNP, with people contesting the prevalent opinion. <coughs> First, they are contesting the origins of carcinogenesis. Basically, it's a mutation constantly occurring in the DNA. For example, many rise from the DNA in copy, and they are correctly repaired. Therefore, why not radiation induced mutation should be repairable also? This is, and they said, repair of cure at very low doses, then it's saturated, and this is the reason why we have here the de facto threshold. <coughs> Maybe this can be the case, but there is a small problem. While it is true that simple DNA damage is largely error-free repairable, our counter-argument is that, however, Radiation can cause destructive clastogenic damage, the repair of which is difficult and didn't error prone. And this happens because radiation can affect the DNA when then the DNA is condensed in the process when the stem cell, stem, stem cell is reproduced. And condensing the DNA into chromosome is a very complex structure which this figure show with some perspective. With dimensions that you can see here, while there are two nanometers for the normal DNA, it go in these nucleosomes, which have a year of 10 nanometers, then pack it together, 30 nanometers, then again pack it, 300, again, and then go to the chromosome of 1400 nanometers. Let's look at this figure with the nucleosome. In the order of 10 nanometers, when we have a 2 nanometer chromosome. 
Well, here is where radiation interacts. And I show you some unscaled figures of what 0.5 mega gamma tracks will produce there, or, or maybe alpha tracks. What they will do is clastogenic double standard lesions, which are typical after radiation exposure. These are not so easy to repair. The template that is there will not serve for the repair. And no surprising, chromosomal deletions and drug locations are well known and very well detected. New techniques, like this one, photographic techniques, can see human chromosomes from workers at Mayak, the Mayak Center. On the left is the normal chromosome, on the right the aberrant chromosome. And you can see the paracentric inversion, pericentric inversion, intersectional deletion, very easily seen. This is real data. Other contestation is on the role of cell death. Cell death can occur by senescence, as is happening in this moment in my brain probably, necrosis, and the famous apoptosis, the DNA programming mutation induced suicide. If a low dose apoptosis rate is bigger than carcinogenesis rate, then there will be a message. And that is certainly the case. Therefore, apoptosis, this is autodestruction of the cell that may occur after the radiation of the cell. The contestant said, if the mutation rate of apoptosis, let's say, is this one, and the mutation rate for carcinogenic is this one, well, below here, you will have a message. Very nice. The product is going to be demonstrated. And the possibility, well, why there will be a threshold for mutation for carcinogenesis, as this figure shows, and not for apoptosis. Why they will grow with different rates crossing each other. If it is demonstrated, it would be a very nice idea, but until now, it has not been demonstrated. There, are contest there have been contestation of the process of carcinogenesis. From in initiation to metastasis, they said, there can be several mutations. This is true for many cancers. This will give a strongly curvilinear dose response with a de facto dose threshold. And the argument is very simple. If the probability is this, proportional to dose, if there are several mutations, any mutations are required, the probability will be a power n of dose. For some cancers, like colon cancer, we know that there are necessary around seven mutations. Therefore, you are going to have a cure of power seven, which is extremely curvilinear. For you are going to have not a linear cure, but a cure like this, which have a de facto of threshold. Of course, let's do something with this cure. Let's change a little the abscissa scale continue to be curvilinear, but now we can see the rate of natural cancer, which is independent of those. And in fact, what we want to see is the difference between the summation and this and the natural cancer, which is what will be known as for source, and the natural cancer. Is this difference which matters and can be shown mathematically that this difference is proportional to dose. The mathematics is in one, in one uh, uh, bulletin of the Swedish Institute, but basically is showing that if the mutation, the normal mutation, is much higher than the mutation due to dose, there is no doubt that this delta will be linear to dose. For any end. There has been contestation of the dose reduction factor also. We say why two? If, we, if it is one, the, the risk factor will increase by a factor of two. Not big deal, but it will increase. This is contestation in the other direction. Radiation is more risky. Well, it is true that radiation is linear with those or low dose of probability, but it's also true that at higher dose, the, the quadratic term has a Away. And therefore, this will be the probability 
of a given level of dose, and the risk will be this probability divided by the dose, if it is quadratic. If we approximate this quadratic with a linear now, well, the risk will be A, D, divided D. And the relation of these two risks are what we call the DDBF factor. Well, uh, it has been shown in the previous year part with some mathematics that this relation under some conditions is approximately between 2 and 3, which is many studies show. But the, one of the more important contestations has been contest con contesting the radio -periodology. And there are two contestations. One, the epidemiological data arise from exposure at relatively high dose only, around 1,000 millisieverts. Second, at very low doses, there are no epidemiological observations. Implication, there are not expected low doses. Well, that we are going to have an area of maximum detectability around here is clear. And that we can find this area just deriving the probability with respect to those and equating to zero is also zero. Clear. In IMPA 9, you may remember that that mechanism showed that differentiating the equation and equating to zero is in the proceedings of IMPA. You will get a maximum dose of observation of around 1,000 to 1,000 millisieverts, where is where normally the epidemiological observation occurs. For the counter argument too, we have to address the issue of detectability limits in radioepidemiology. And I will apologize to the many radioepidemiologists in the, in, the, in the room because I will try to simplify this. But certainly, because radiation is a weak carcinogenic, it's impossible to detect effect of low doses due to statistical fluctuation. If we have a control group, and these are the number of people, the number of cancer, and the probability of natural cancer in this control group, and we have a exposed group with the same value, but now with exposed number of cancers, for we are added, adding here the probability of the radiation in this cancer. What will happen? That in the control group, we, ha we have a number of natural cancers that will move, fluctuate statistically. And in the exposed group, the same. We will have an a fluctuation of now number of natural cancer and radiation induced cancer. And what the epidemiologists want to see is this difference. And this is very difficult to detect when the two variables are moving like this. And they will tell you that if the distribution is normal, and I know that many distributions are not normal, but for the sake of the argument will not change, the standard deviation is that, and if we want to see, we want to see this with two standard deviations. You will not see anything statistical. Well, if you operate algebraically, it will show that the number of people that you need is a constant divided the square, the, the square of the of of both. And this can be easily done for solid cancer and we give you that for one millisiever you will need one billion people to see anything epidemiological. This can be plotted. If you plot those versus people, you will have a relationship like this with a region where you detect, a, re a region where you cannot detect statistically. And as I said, for one millisiever you will need 10 to 9 people. For not surprisingly, no surprisingly, for Chernobyl, where we have in Europe 300 residents with around 10 millisieverts of those, nothing has been detected because the point of detection is below the detection curve unless you se select a special cluster, very high dose, in, in a way that they go into the region of detectability. For leukemias, this cure will be go down. Why? Because leukemia has much less uh, incidence naturally, much more easy to detect. And therefore, for Chernobyl liquidators, we are more or less in the line. This should have been detected just in the limit. An earlier professor Ivanov that is here told me the other day that for the first time, small numbers are appearing of leukemia in liquidators. But this is not the case for thyroid cancer in children. 
where with very small dose you can detect because cancer in children of thyroid is very, very rare. And not surprisingly, in Belarus, we have saw all these cancers in children. For hereditary effects, the cure will go even up because hereditary effects are very common among us. And for one millisiever, unless you do some statistical trick, you will need 10 to 12 people. Really very difficult to detect unless there are some Martians around. Notwithstanding all this, challenges to LMT continue to be widespread. For the time probably is right to ask ourselves, should the possibility of a threshold influence radiation protection? Charlan did that, and he tried to convince us that the certainty of a threshold may influence radiation protection. But his uncertain possibility, uncertain possibility, should not challenge the current paradigm. And if you plot statistically with the probability density cure, the data of uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, you can see this in the CFP report 126, you will have a cure like this, more or less centered in 10% per sieve. You remember this before, divided by a factor of two. The cumulative probability is this one, with confidence limit that go between 7.5 and 12.5. When you convert this data to a given population, in this case this conversion has been done for the US population, with the US with the reduction factor of two, well you will have a, approximately a log normal distribution. Here is the cumulative probability with the confidence limit between 1.2 and 8.8. And I will concentrate in this cumulative probability distribution. Let's model a threshold uncertainty. Let's assume that there is a threshold with a given probability. You tell me how much. Let's say 20%. The resulting uncertainty distribution now will be truncated at probability 20% risk zero. But the rest of the distribution will be the same. For what will happen is that this distribution with this upper limit will be truncated at 20%. As you can see, the upper limit of, of risk has not moved too much in spite of the probability of threshold of 20%. Let's now increase the probability. Let's go to 50%. With 50%, we truncate at 50%, and there we start to see some risk. But not very much. From 8.8, .8, the upper limit went to 7%. Let's go to 80% probability that there is a pressure. If we now make the cut of the curve in a manner that 80% probability is zero. Now there is a change, but again, the upper limit is still 5% per zero. In summary, starting with an upper limit of risk of 8.8%, with 20% we went to 7, with 80% we went to 5% per zero. Therefore, the only possibility for us to use a threshold is to have the certainty, the mechanical certainty that there is a threshold. Namely, given our epidemiological limitation, the uncertainty of a threshold should not influence radiation protection, should not influence our work. Moreover, would an eventual nonlinear relationship be applicable in practice? I mentioned this several times. Suppose that the biologists came tomorrow and tell us that we have a relationship like this. What we are going to do? For a given delta dose, there will be a given delta probability. Now, if we, for instance, the person is working for many times, and now the dose of the probability is, is bigger, for the same delta dose, will appear a different delta probability. How the regulator is going to regulate two different delta doses that will give two different probabilities depending on the age of the person, the amount of work that he has had. 
But the questioning has not been only in, in, in biology and epidemiology. The system itself has been questioned. This system has been told is too complicated. And perhaps it is. ICRP has been doing a very big effort trying to simplify the system, and tomorrow we will have opportunity to discuss this simplification. But also, there has been a disputing on the quantification, moving from those to risk. Well, in any protection discipline, for an artful agent, you have risk and you have protection. For radiation exposure, our agent, we have radiation risk, we have radiation protection. But our forefathers have a very, a very intelligent move to use no radiation risk, but radiation dose. And of course, this is not easy. We need activity in the body and fluence that arrive to the body to be converted into absorbent dose. But we know that different radiation cause different effects. Therefore, we need to weigh this into an equivalent dose order by order. Then, we know that each organ has different radio sensitivity. We have to weigh this again into an effective dose. We have built up conversion factors from activity into equivalent dose and effective dose, which are regulated today. We have built up conversion factors for fluids into equivalent dose and effective dose. Again, is this system too complicated? People said yes, and therefore let's move to the risk. Because why not? If you want to measure risk, let's move to the risk. Not so simple. Use a risk and protection quantity, not so simple. First of all, our nuclear safety experts use risk as an expectation of harm. We are using risk as a probability of harm. But what probability? Is the probability linear? which can never exert 100%, or is a probability per year, which age, which will exert 100% of high age. Usually statisticians use the probability rate. In the famous Gompert Martin cure, we show the probability that we have to die at a given age. And as you know, the lowest is in the order of 2 in 10,000 at the age of around 10. If you move our risk factor and add to this probability, Google probability is what I said to you. Well, the information that provide is not so important. With 50 millisiever per year, it shows that the movement is small. But it's difficult to, for taking decision. If we use the dead probability rate in absolute, what we will see is at a different age, the pro dead probability rate changes a lot. What the regulator is going to do? To use different standards at different age. This for the multiplicative model and also for the additive model, you will see that there is big change. Please don't let's not insist to move from our system of those. It will not help our life, it will complicate our life. What we have to confront is the characterization of individual members of the public and the critical group concept. When Dick Griffith made all the, the measurements in Chernobyl, one of our big surprises was real, identical definition of political group there, a small group of people doing all the same. The doses differ by one order of money. Not in one village, but in many. Here, for three orders of money to the Novosisto, or for nearly three orders of money to the Prague, where we apply the word in the middle, Extreme, we are not able to define that. And that, yes, is important rather than to, to imagine a movement from those to other systems. One main objection has been to the collective those concepts, and I believe we have to address this as well. Collective those concepts is a very simple concept. In addition to the those who are person, we believe that when many persons are receiving the same dose, the situation is different. There are more expectations of harm there. The intended use was very noble. Deciding protection option at work, for instance, you have two working options, with one will collect with those one, another working option with a different collective dose. The industry has been using this for years. When one collective dose is higher than the other, other conditions be the same, the option will have collected, uh, the lower collective dose is the preferred one. 
We have these IDs also for discharge control. If we have one option with a given collective load, another option with another given collective load, all the conditions the same, obviously we have to decide for the option that gives the lower collective load. But unfortunately, many people were using at least collective loads in a different manner. In this cure of those and people, in the region of undetectability, they have multiplied a given population, let's say, at the middle of people, see the given load. The product of this area is the collective loss, and they multiply the collective loss by the risk factor, and they came with 5,000 points. And this has produced a lot of problems. The real question is not solving deleting the collective loss. The real question is how we answer this question. Do the effects in this vision of detectability actually occur? That is the question. And for that question, we have been valiant and to say that we have epistemological limitations. We have not yet ground of knowledge. We believe that they are there, but we cannot measure them. And science needs to show measurements. We cannot measure these this bodies. And we have to say that very clearly. Deleting the collective laws is just putting the problem under the carpet and not really dealing with the real problem. But other problem with the collective laws is the collective laws over time. People saw, well, these people were receiving a discharge, but over time, the same people will receive a lot of those. Therefore, the rate of the collective laws will vary over time. And the mathematicians came and they said, let's integrate this cure, and the collective laws over time was calculated. People were particularly afraid doing this when the modelists start to make calculations up to the year 1 million, even presuming that the dose limit of ICLP will be the same in the year 1 million, something that I don't believe. The intention was really different. For instance, if we want to check a barrier, let's say, for controlling radioactive waste in, in relatively short time, and we have a movement of collective load rate over time, let's say something like this. And we have another bar with a different change of collective loss over time. Both of these integrals will be an infinite integral is of the loss rate over time. But what we want to know is not this infinite integral. We want to know the difference between these two curves to decide what option we are going to use. And this difference is the difference between two infinite integrals that, as has been shown in ICRP clearly, are finite integrals over time. For the problem, not so severe, but can be problematic in, in, in when options are over many, many of time. But the important reason for using the collective laws was presented in the 173 civil lecture by Bully Dell in Washington, I.E. Part 3, 30 years ago. Steel is valid. What Bull said was something that is, seemed to be near obvious, but was not so obvious 30 years ago. That after one year of activity, if we get a given dose, the following years, even if we stop that activity, people will continue to receive dose. If now we continue for a two years' time, people will continue to receive now the dose of the first year and the second. And the third year time will be like this, and this will go up and up, up and up and end in a figure like this, where you can see that if you want to do the control in the top, the summation here is equal to the summation of all this square here, meaning the integral. Well, this can be very hypothetical, because today we have a small part of nuclear power plants. But if really the economical, the energy crisis continue, and this can happen tomorrow, and we have a very big part of nuclear power plants, then we need to assure how we are going to protect this poor fellow there in the future, receiving doses from all these combination of parts. And what we told at that time was that in order to limit future doses from today's continuous practice, it will be necessary to restrict all those committed over time by the given unit practice. That is to say, to limit the collective dose commitment per megawatt electric 
producer from the nuclear industry. And this is still valid if we have an expanded nuclear energy. For don't stop the collective laws and let's move to far forward. The challenges to the present epidemiology of additional candidates. My motto here will be the present event itself in the act of throwing away previous accomplishments and challenges, challenging the future. Is a close, close book the health effect of radiation? Certainly not. The time and scale of the phenomena limit our knowledge. We have exposure occurring in fraction of second manifestation of effects occurring years after. Physical chemistry help here, epidemiology at the end. Biology, in the previous days, physiology here, and we don't know what is happening there. We don't know even for deterministic effects, where we, know, we believe that we know all. We know that there is a threshold here of probability versus loss, as I showed to you. But if we plot this over time, then this curve will go to go in this direction, and we don't know yet, today, what are the thresholds for protected deterministic exposure from protected exposure, for this many room for real improvement here. But there are other targeted stochastic effects or not? Well, cardiovascular effects has been very popular. Epidemiologists tell us that perhaps in Chernobyl workers, atomic bomb survivors, and even radiotherapy patients seem to suffer a higher risk of cardiovascular disease. This has been studied, we don't know. It's a potential mechanism, but really we don't know. But in addition, as Kea has told you recently, we have to look for many non targeted effects. Genomic instability, or an increased rate of acquisition of alteration in the genome. Do you remember that we started with this? Well, in fact, apparently we are wrong here. The mutation is repaired, but the new mutation can appear in the future due to genomic instability. We might be wrong also here. The cells survive not with a stable mutation, but with a mutation that can change in the future. By standard effects, or ability of cells affected by radiation to convey manifestation damage to other cells. We have a paralogism. We said, if radiation mutates the gene in a cell nucleus, change in other cells cannot be affected. Well, apparently this is wrong. In fact, experiments show that if you have many cells and we affect one particular cell, our presumption that there was no change in all the other cells is wrong. In some others, there are the end mutations in spite of they have not, they have not been affected. A scopal effect, something that radiotherapy is new for years. Significant tissue respond to radiation in tissues separate from the radiation exposed area. Works, radiation of liver, for instance, you have get effect on marrow. Is a bystander effect? Nobody knows, but we have to study. Clastrogenic plasma factor. We know that the radiating plasma can induce detrimental effect in an exposed cell. There are very interesting experiments shown with, with mouse in a scale where mouse has been irradiated, the, the plasma taken away, mixed with, with peripheral blood lymphocytes from the mouse that has not been irradiated, and you have effects in the peripher peripheral blood lymphocytes. Can radiation affect the immune system? Well, the immune system is there apparently to protect us from infection and cancer. If radiation affected, this can affect our understanding today of the situation. Adaptive response, one popular. We know that if radiation affects the cell, we have a number of mutations. In fact, more radiation affected, we have more mutations. But experiments say that if we affect radiation with one amount, let's say with one amount of radiation, then with more, the mutations are less. In summary, that condition in those give a response a challenging dose gives a higher response. The summation of a conditioned dose plus a challenging dose gives a response that is lower than expected. This will show that the system is very dynamic. If the system is very dynamic, and value with those, 
a good question that I presented in Hiroshima, I continue to present here, is should the second derivative of the dose influence the risk? If it is dynamic, the second derivative should have an effect. Let me show this graphically. In background doses, we have a rate which is constant, a dose which increases with time, a second derivative of dose which is zero. But in the bomb survival, we have a rate that even big, a dose which is a threshold, and a second derivative that is very high, extremely high. The background dose can be compared also with air crew, the same. The rate in air crew go very quickly when the plane go up. If one does know to which port one is sailing, no wind is favorable. Toward which port we should we sail? My proposal, radiation protection should navigate towards an harmonized and sustainable worldwide regime. Less using the VSS of the Foundation build a comprehensive set of mandatory international standards. Less formalize the international system that we have in this moment for appraising compliance with this standard. Less unravel the Cold War radiological legacy that is still in our shoulders. Less consolidate the international system for reviewing radiological accidents. We have done a lot, but much, much more is needed to learn less of it. Less foster international understanding for limiting discharges in the environment that ensure protection of human and also their habitat, as suggested in the Stockholm Conference recently. For ensuring proper protection conditions for workers, as ensured in the Geneva Conference on Occupational Protection Today at all. For providing for the protection of patients, the message that we have received from the Minister today, as was requested in the Malaga conference. For safely managing all radioactive waste, as requested in the conference, in the Corolla conference, conference, but let's not stop there. Let's help the developing world to achieve effective and sustainable radiation protection infrastructure, as suggested in the Morocco conference just a few months ago. Let's not forget that the world has 192 states, all with radiation protection problems. Let's help them and persuade them to be committed to helping each other. Let's benefit from good examples. The one that were mentioned today, the Ibero-American Forum of Regulators and the Ibero-American Radiation Protection Network. In summary, let's spread our achievements around the world. The time is right for binding commitments for an harmonized, efficient, and sustainable global radiation protection regime. I would like to conclude my lecture with a suggestion. Let's convince our political masters to work toward an international convention on radiation protection. Because there will be no protection for only a fast unless there is protection for all. Thank you very much for your interest and your comments. Multiply a given population, let's say 
are the video peak series given those. The product of this area is the collective loss, and they multiply the collective loss by the risk factor, and they came with 5,000 points. And this has produced a lot of problems. The real question is not solving deleting the collective loss. The real question is how we answer this question. Do the effects in this vision of detectability actually occur? That is the question. And for that question, we have been valiant and to say that we have epistemological limitations. We have not yet ground of knowledge. We believe that they are there, but we cannot measure them. And science needs to show measurements. We cannot measure these, these bodies. And we have to say that very clearly. Deleting the collective dose is just putting the problem under the carpet and not really dealing with the real problem. But other problem with the collective loss is the collective loss over time. People saw, well, these people were receiving at this time, but over time, the same people will receive a lot of loss. Therefore, the rate of the collective loss will vary over time. And the mathematicians came and they said, let's integrate this cure and the collective dose over time was calculated. People were particularly afraid doing this when the modelists start to make calculations up to the year 1 million, even presuming that the dose limit of ICLP will be the same in the year 1 million, something that I don't believe. The intention was really different. For instance, if we want to check a barrier, let's say, for controlling radioactive waste in, in relatively short time, and we have a movement of collective dose rate over time, let's say something like this, and we have another barrier with a different change of collective dose over time, both of these integrals will be an infinite integral is of the dose rate over time. But what we want to know is not this infinite integral. We want to know the difference between these two curves to decide what option we are going to do. And this difference is the difference between two infinite integrals that, as has been shown in ICRP clearly, are finite integrals over time. For the problem not so severe, but can be problematic in, in, in when options are over many, many of time. But the important reason for using the collective dose was presented in the 173 civil lecture by Bully Dell in Washington, I did part three, 30 years ago, still is valid. What Bull said was something that is, seemed to be near obvious, but was not so obvious 30 years ago. That after one year of activity, if we get a given dose, the following years, even if we stop that activity, people will continue to receive dose. If now we continue for a two years time, we will continue to receive now the dose of the first year and the second. And the third year time will be like this, and this will go up and up, up and up, and end in a figure like this, where you can see that if you want to do the control in the top, the summation here is equal to the summation of all this square here, meaning the integral. Well, this can be very hypothetical, because today we have a small part of neutral power plant. But if really the economical, the energy crisis continue, and this can happen tomorrow, and we have a very big part of neutral power plant, then we need to assure how we are going to protect this poor fellow there in the future, receiving doses from all these combination of water. And what we told at that time was that in order to limit future dose from today continuous practice, it will be necessary to restrict all those committed over time by the given unit practice. That is to say, to limit the collective dose commitment per megawatt electric producer from the nuclear industry. And this is still valid if we have an expanded nuclear energy. For don't stop the collective dose and let's move to part four. The challenges to the present epidemiology of additional candidates. My motto here will be the present invent itself in the act of throwing away previous accomplishments and challenges challenging the future. 
Is a closed close book the kind of effect of radiation? Certainly not. The time and scale of the phenomena limit our knowledge. We have exposure occurring in fraction of second manifestation of effects occurring years after. Physical chemistry helped here, epidemiology at the end. Biology, in the previous days, physiology here, and we don't know what is happening there. We don't know even for deterministic effects, where we, know, we believe that we know all. We know that there is a threshold here of probability versus those, as I showed to you. But if we plot this over time, then this curve will go to go in this direction, and we don't know yet today what are the thresholds for protected deterministic exposure from protected exposure. For this many room for real improvement here. But there are other targeted stochastic effects or not? Well, cardiovascular effects has been very popular. Epidemiologists tell us that perhaps in Chernobyl workers, atomic bomb survivors, and even radiotherapy patients seem to suffer a higher risk of cardiovascular disease. This has been studied, we don't know. It's a potential mechanism, but really we don't know. But in addition, as Kea has told you recently, we have to look for many non targeted effects. Genomic instability, or an increased rate of acquisition of alteration in the genome. You remember that we started with this. Well, in fact, apparently, we are wrong here. The mutation is repaired, but the new mutation can appear in the future due to genomic instability. We might be wrong also here. The cells survive not with a stable mutation, but with a mutation that can change in the future. By standard effects, or ability of cells affected by radiation to convey manifestation damage to other cells. We have a paralogism. We said, if radiation mutates the gene in a cell nucleus, gene in other cells cannot be affected. Well, apparently this is wrong. In fact, experiments show that if you have many cells, and we affect one particular cell, our presumption that there was no change in all the other cells is wrong. In some others, there are the mutations in spite of they have not, they have not been affected. Ascopal effects, something that radiotherapy is new for years. Significant tissue respond to radiation in tissues separate from the radiation exposed area. Works, radiation of liver, for instance, you have to get the effect of marrow. Is a bystander effect? Nobody knows, but we have to study. Trastrogenic plasma factor. We know that the radiating plasma can induce detrimental effect in an exposed cell. There are very interesting experiments shown with, with mouse in a scale, where mouse has been irradiated, the, the plasma taken away, mixed with, with peripheral blood lymphocytes from the mouse that has not been irradiated, and you have effects in the peripher peripheral blood uh, lymphocytes. Can radiation affect the immune system? Well, the immune system is there, apparently, to protect us from infection and cancer. If radiation affected, this can affect our understanding today of the situation. Adaptive response, one popular. We know that if radiation affects the cell, we have a number of mutations. In fact, more radiation affected, we have more mutations. But experiments say that if we affect radiation with one amount of cell, with one amount of radiation, then with more, the mutations are less. In summary, that condition in those give a response, a challenge in those give a higher response, the summation of a condition in those plus a challenge in those give a response that is lower than expected. This will show that the system is very dynamic. If the system is very dynamic, and value with those, a good question that I presented in Hiroshima, I continue to present here, is should the second derivative of the dose influence the risk? If it is dynamic, the second derivative should have an effect. Let me show this graphically. In background doses, we have a rate which is constant, a dose which increases with time, a second derivative of dose which is zero. But in the bomb survival, we have a rate that gives a peak. 
e dos UCIS threshold and the second derivative that is very high, extremely high. The background dose can be compared also with R blue, the same. The rate in R blue go very quickly when the plane go up. If one does know to which port one is sailing, no wind is favorable. Toward which port we should we sail? My proposal. Radiation protection should navigate towards an harmonized and sustainable worldwide regime. Less use in the BSS of the Foundation build a comprehensive set of mandatory international standards. Less formalize the international system that we have in this moment for appraising compliance with this standard. Less unravel the Cold War radiological legacy that is still in our shoulders. Let's consolidate the international system for reviewed radiological accidents. We have done a lot, but much, much more is needed to learn less of it. Let's foster international understanding for limiting discharge in the environment that ensure protection of human and also the habitat, as suggested in the Stockholm Conference recently. For ensuring proper protection conditions for workers, as ensured in the Geneva Conference on Occupational Protection with ILO. For providing for the protection of patients, the message that we have received from the Minister today, as was requested in the Malaga Conference. For safely managing all radioactive waste, as requested in the conference, in the Cordova Conference, Code of Conference, but let's not stop there. Let's help the developing world to achieve effective and sustainable radiation protection infrastructure, as suggested in the Morocco conference just a few months ago. Let's not forget that the world has 192 states, all with radiation protection problems. Let's help them and persuade them to be committed to helping each other. Let's benefit from good examples. The one that were mentioned today, the Ibero-American Forum of Regulators, at the Euro American Radiation Protection Network. In summary, let's spread our achievements around the world. The time is right for binding commitments for an harmonized, efficient, and sustainable global radiation protection regime. I would like to conclude my lecture with a suggestion. Let's convince our political masters to work toward an international convention on radiation protection. Because there will be no protection for all your past unless there is protection for all. Thank you very much for your interest and your comments.